Hello, good afternoon. How are you guys? My name is Juan Bautista Rupat. I'm based here in Western Australia, and today we have the privilege to talk to Rob Chama. How are you, Rob? Fine, thanks. Juan, yourself? Yeah, very good, very good. It's, um, it's not as sunny over there in Christchurch. It's a bit cloudy, uh, but it is what it is. Yeah, well, it's actually uh, the sun's just come out, especially for you. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So um, if you want, you can do a bit of introduction about yourself, Rob. Probably most of the people in the football world know you anyway. But OK, well, my name is Rob Sherman. I've been lucky enough to work in the game for quite a while. Um, originally uh, from Wales, uh, where I played, worked for the Welsh FA. I've worked for the New Zealand FA, Australian FA, spent some time in Melbourne Victory and various other football bodies. So uh, got a quite a broad uh, experience of football from grassroots to senior international men's football. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much a summary of where I'm at. I'm a pro license holder and pro license instructor as well. Awesome, yeah. For the people, um, probably pretty much everyone should, should know Rob by now. If you don't Google him and you will see how amazing things he did and he been doing in football. Um, so Rob, talk. Talk to me a bit about um, what are you doing at the moment? I know you have a consultant business. Um, can you please explain your current situation? Yeah, so I set the consultancy up well, probably about 10 years ago, just because obviously like acting or something, now and again, you're out of work in the football business or out of employment. And so uh, an opportunity to to keep my hands in and work with various people. At the moment, I'm uh, del written and delivered a, delivering a pro license course for the Singapore FA. Um, that's predominantly what I'm working on. I've done a little bit of work for the uh, player development project. Uh, I've put together a grassroots coaching course for mums and dads with them. And uh, have one or two conversations going on around different projects, but nothing quite um, tangible yet so well, there's always something in the offing but um, you know like the main focus at the minute is this pro license awesome and what is the website of your consultant business uh, it's just Rob Sherman sorry Rob at Rob Sherman football consultant dot com nice and short and snappy eh? <laughs> easy well done good job um, so I mean I personally know about you and I've been lucky to do the A license with you in New Zealand and you were the technical director and you came back here to Australia when you set up everything and you even have the privilege to be on, I think it was the last stay, uh, Western Australia State Workshop um, because after that um, COVID-19 hit. But my question is, when, why and how your passion for football started um, I guess back in well when you were a little boy. Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm the youngest of three. I have an older brother and an older sister. My dad was a very good sportsman and played, you know, football, box, played golf, was a parachute training instructor, etc. And so, and a physiotherapist, and that sort of uh, sporting passion initiated there. My brother played lots of sport, but played football. So as a youngster, do you join in with that? And from an early age, I started kicking a ball and quite liked it. In fact, my grandfather said to me, you know, when he was alive, that he could never actually remember me without a ball. Um, ah, nice. So I started very, early, started very early. And I think just the, the love of kicking a ball around and actually being able to slowly get the better of it and master it and... And of course, street football was the norm in those days. So, you know, if you went to school, you played at lunchtime, morning break, afternoon break, maybe had a kick around after. Um, so most of it was informal play and that passion just grew and grew. There was a formal league established in about 1967 when I was about seven. And so I started playing in the under 11s at seven. And yeah, having that regular game on top of your sort of informal game uh, well, you know, practice was great, and that's really kept the momentum going, I suppose. So, you know, I was lucky enough then to progress into senior football at about 14 years of age. Wow. Um, 
played for the local youth team at 13, 14, got into the town reserve team at 14, played in the first team at 15, and then turned pro at 16. Awesome. In, in Wales or in England? In Wales. So I joined Cardiff City when I was 16 as a, an apprentice and signed pro as a, well, I was nearly 17 and signed pro as, a, as an 18 year old. Um, well, um, two questions. Who, if you remember your first coach, um, and what do you, you do you remember about him? Uh, well, basically, um, yeah, my first coach uh, would be, I suppose it's a bit, bit of a, an anomaly, really, because we got no coaching. So there was no coaching. Um, so the reality is the first person I remember is a games teacher called Anthony Evans. Anthony's still around, a uh, fantastic guy, very sort of engaging. And he organized games, basically, and we played games. Um, and, you know, I would, we were playing with older boys, uh, lucky enough to do that, as well as with your mates of your own age group. And if I'm honest, that's pretty much how it was all the way through. So by and large, the coaching you got was more... Um, people advice if you like or behavioral advice mm. rather than technical or tactical but you you were playing a lot informal football on the street and kicking the wall around with your mates every day pretty much oh yeah both and you actually got a lot of coaching if you like from your older mates who you know might tell you you need to pass more or and you learned i mean ultimately you learned that sometimes you're the better player sometimes you're not and you have to adapt accordingly so you know, it, uh, the game taught you really just by playing and practicing enough. Awesome. And last question about your playing career. What was your highlight as a player? Uh, well, turning pro was one. Um, I was lucky enough to turn pro. I had three years as a pro and then sort of fell out of the game, as you often do. Uh, didn't quite make it. Um, I played for my country at youth level, which was good, um, which was nice. Uh, I suppose, I suppose the big highlight is uh, after I finished as a pro, I still wanted to play, um, you know, and actually played here in mainland reserve league at 55 or something like that, you know, um, so ne never left, let, lost the passion to play football. Um, and I suppose in some respects, you know, that that's never left. Um, but yeah, I mean, There'll be lots of little moments where, you know, we got to the Welsh Cup final as Aberystwyth Town in 1976 and lost to Wrexham in the final. That was great, you know, with a sort of amateur group of lads. Obviously playing for my country. I did make a first team debut in for Cardiff in the Welsh Cup um, and little things like that. So loads of little moments, but not, not exactly any... Um, anything that you'd get to the mountaintops and shout about. So certainly not a, a fantastic career. It's still amazing. You play for your own country, play for the first team when you were so young and play in other countries. So awesome. So Thank going you. now more into the coaching um, role, um, what advice would you give to young players? I think the first thing is, you know, is just enjoy it. So, you know, it it's, seems as though everyone it seems as though far too often players play for a reason you know it's uh you know to be a good to be a pro or to be whatever um and i think that can be damaging in this respect because ultimately only, only you know something like 99.98 percent of footballers do not play professionally so only 0.02 percent so the reality is the vast majority of us are playing for fun and, and maybe earn a few shillings or a few cents if you're lucky. So you're playing for fun. So the first thing is, and make sure you enjoy it. And, you know, and, and that's, that's the biggest advice I'd get. Secondly is, you know, try and be the best you can be. And if the best you can be is, you know, not a pro and not at, say, good amateur level, that's still okay mm -hmm. as, long as, you have, as long as you have fun. Because um, that's where the vast majority of footballers are. Yeah, that's true. I mean, 
even if you um, look the Argentinian team now, the national team with Scaloni, when they, they won the Copa America after 28 years. Yeah. But my point I want to say is that when I look at the players, and Messi and Di Maria and all the new ones, they look really happy at training. They look really yeah. happy playing. And they, they celebrate the winning the Copa America like I will celebrate, like you will celebrate for days. And they were all dancing and this and there. And, and you could see that was Messi like a little boy with the cup taking selfie and with the mates. And it's all about that, you know, even at that level, when it's too serious that like before and they felt the pressure, they never deliver. And now where they are happy playing and playing for the country or your club or whatever, um, they are winning, you know, they're doing well um, and they're having a good time. Yeah, for most players, you know, intrinsic motivation is the factor, you know, um, for one or two, obviously, extrinsic, you know, the money and the like, you know, they may obviously if you come from dire poverty, then that's going to be a factor, but most of it is intrinsic. It's an actual love of the game, the love of doing something special, whether that's a tackle or a great dribble or something, you know, depending on your capabilities. It's that love, which I think is fundamental and, uh, you know, and, and inspect coaches and make sure we do not crush that love. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so we talk about young players um, or players. Uh, what about for advice for beginners coaches in the game? Well, I think the first, yeah, again, the other thing is, is help the players love the game. So, you know, it, ultimately, mostly when you're in the situation where you're a young and inexperienced coach, it's best just to facilitate activities. So keep the players busy, you know, make things relatively uh, short. So don't stay in the same practice for too long because they'll get bored, you know, um, and and wherever possible, you know, make it as much as the, like the game as possible. Certainly for those younger ones where they don't want to be stood in lines waiting for a go, you know, uh, you don't want to have a go and then you fail and then it's another minute or three before you have another chance. You want to have another go straight away. Um, and so really keeping them busy and don't overcoach, you know, don't try and fix everything in one night. It takes <laughs> years and years to, to progress. And if you just keep, keep the sessions light and active, um, the real measure of whether you're doing a good job is the players keep coming back. And any different for maybe more advanced coaches and advanced? Well, I think obviously the fundamental is you keep it, keep enjoying it. I mean, if, if it becomes a, almost like a job or like a homework, um, you know, then that's not a good environment for the players. But obviously, you know, as the players progress, you want to make sure you have an individual focus. So how are you helping the players to maximize their potential? It's not necessarily about the team performance. It's about individuals. I think also at that, you know, there's that balance between you know, obviously, as a coach, you want to be known as a coach who wins games, perhaps. But equally so, if you're in the youth space, well, maybe you want to be known as a coach that develops players. And, you know, that the reward of that comes many, many years after you've had a hand on that player. It doesn't come at that particular time. So, you know, I, I will look at players who are currently playing, maybe in the league or, or professionally, and you know you might have contributed 2% to their growth, but the fact they're playing or players who didn't make it as pros are still playing, you know you didn't damage them. And that's probably as rewarding as anything. That's true. Um, so thinking about more the bigger picture, um, and I know you are in New Zealand at the moment, Kratos, what do you think about the current um, situation of football in New Zealand? Um, well, it, I mean, uh, football's pretty much transitional continually. Um, I do think that um, there's a danger in some countries, um, and particularly in New Zealand, that, you know, you, you don't set the bar high enough. So I know the game's amateur here, um, but that can often be an excuse for mediocrity. Mm. And I think it's important that uh, you help people, coaches, clubs, players 
reach their potential. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and I think, you know, that therefore you set the bar high, but you also have to recognize that other people just want to play for fun. And that and that's another thing. There's nothing wrong with just playing for fun. So, you know, if I want to be in the National League, there needs to be a pathway for that. That's improved with the opening up of the National League. But, you know, you need to think where the game needs to be in 10 years time. And I think unilaterally, the associations, both in Australia and New Zealand, don't think in that way. Don't think 20 years ahead. They think of next year. Yeah, and, and I guess it's a big danger. I guess in, in youth development, you know, if we look what the Germans did after the 90 year World Cup and then 2014, unfortunately, beating Argentina in the final one nil, but they won the World Cup, but it took them 15, 20 years, the same with the French, Belgium, Wales, to, to see something happening, you know, winning or, you know, making the World Cup. Um, so take long, much longer time than one year or two years to see your success and everything you're doing if you are in the right direction, I guess. Yeah, and, and fundamentally, though, it's, you know, what they put in place were technical programs. They weren't, you know, a good administration helps, obviously, but technical programs developed by technicians. And I do think that the technical side of the game is undervalued in both Australia and New Zealand. What, why do you think that? Why the people don't um, value that technical stuff and the people maybe doing more? they spending, like for example, when I need to do a report or something like that, for my, me, my priority is to be on the ground, coaching coaches, supporting clubs, and then the report, of course, I have to do it. But for me, my priority and the difference I can make, I believe, with the skills I have is on the ground. Uh, but then sometimes then I will, <laughs> the people will be upset because I didn't send a report. But I say, well, I'm trying to do my best, but I just have so much to do. Um, and you need to prioritize. But sometimes I can see that the priorities maybe on the admin part, they almost look like they, they need to be higher than the other ones. I think, uh, yeah, I do think that there's a, a bit of a discord. I mean, ultimately, the administration of the game and the technical development of the game is a marriage. You know, the one can't live without the other. So, you know, it's not all about the technicians and it's not all about the administrators. I just think that there's um, a, maybe a lack of understanding of how intricate development really is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most development has been developed by technicians, people who played or coached, and they've come up with innovations to, you know, uh, improve schools football, uh, school, you know, as in being taught in school, coaching frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, coach education. Um, and it, that needs to be valued. And you need to be able to think of how society is moving, how the game is moving uh, in terms of time and space. It's becoming less time, less space. So players will have to be better technically, better vision, have to un and be able to read the game, et cetera. And Therefore, there needs to be a, a clear alignment between strategy that grows the financial side of the game and its stability, which is vital. So the administrators are, are doing pretty good in that way, in that space. But then that needs to be aligned to the quality of the player, uh, the environment for the player, and the quality of player coming through. And that, to me, seems undervalued and sort of almost an afterthought. So if you're not careful, the game in the future will be a very poor version in countries like Australia and New Zealand, where football is not the predominant sport than it currently is, because society has changed. Though informal play, you know, spending hours and hours of practice, uh, those days are gone. They're relying totally on the club to develop them. And of course, if the club's not a great environment and the coach isn't particularly skilled, then you'll have some issues. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so, I mean, you did ask for it away, but what about the future for Australia and New Zealand with the World Cup coming to 2023 um, to both countries? Also, I know um, most of the association federations have a plan for infrastructure and set up high performance uh, sports, like for example, here in Perth, 
uh, will have um, the home of football in Perth. I know in Queensland, something similar. Um, so how do you see the future? You think they, they bring in the Women World Cup to both countries will benefit the game or is still a lot of work to be underneath and this legacy um, programs to make sure that you have the impact that you should cut because of bringing a major FIFA tournament to your country. Well, I think um, ultimately it's a fantastic achievement for both countries and a great opportunity. And so, you know, both have a pedigree. So the Matildas and the Ferns are, you know, two well-ranked teams and there's a long history of women's football in both nation, nations, which, you know, they're rightly proud of. I think the challenge, of course, is that, you know, the, the women's game is not in its infancy, far from it, but, you know, the critical mass of players, you know, needs to grow. And uh, so not only the, the top and pathways to excellence, but also, you know, the ability for young girls just to play the game and have a, have a, have a go. And in my experience um, around the world, but, you know, it, it seemed at one stage, certainly, that if players didn't sort of make the under 17s, they packed the game in. It was as though being a Matilda was everything or nothing. And the same with the Ferns. And I think that that needs to change. We, we need to recognise that the game is for everyone. And we know that, you know, male, female, um, able, disabled, whatever the case may be, there's, the football has a role to play for everyone. So the challenge I see is not so much, um, not only the future of the game in terms of high performance, but actually all those young girls who think, have an experience of the World Cup and then go, I want to try football. Can the game cope with them? And I think that's the biggest thing because ultimately the game should be embracing those young girls and those women who want to play and there should be an opportunity to play. But are we ready? Is the game being prepared to accept the, uh, meet the demand if you like? And that would be my biggest concern is uh, being capable of meeting the demand. And, uh, and I think, you know, historically there've been tournaments in the region and you know, maybe girls have not had the positive experience when they've seen a game, they've been motivated to go and join a club and they've not had a good experience and they've left the game. So um, I'm sure there's things afoot, but that would be the biggest thing is actually what's the programs been put in place that are going to enable clubs to accept, hopefully, the influx of players who get motivated by these tournaments. So to kind of need to be ready. You are setting the market and you're doing a campaign of marketing to grow the game. And then yeah. you need to be ready, kind of like, I don't know, we're producing chocolate, we produce, we are making advertising on social media. So we are selling 1,000 and they come to me and say, oh no, you need to wait two months. And they're like, yes, really? No, well, we'll buy something else. Then. Yeah, oh, you know, and, and typically around major events, events happen, so there'll be, fun days, girls galas and things like this. So they go, oh, I like this, this is great. And then when they go, well, where do I go now? Ah, hmm, we have a bit of a problem, nowhere to go. And so this is for me, the fundamental is, right? We need to make sure that existing clubs are geared up to accept an influx of new members. And there will be girls and boys, you know, people will get motivated by it and we need to be able to, to accept them. and and get them into the fold and keep them there. Awesome, very good. Um, so anything else you want to talk, mention, some color? Uh, not really, I mean, ultimately the game is the game. I think, uh, you know, it's, it is the world's most popular sport for a reason. Um, you know, ultimately you can play, two of you can have a game of football, you know, five can play a game, Five aside can be a great game, and obviously we've got the eleven aside version. It's a fantastic sport. Um, there are challenges, I think. You know, as we've mentioned, that the world is changing, and the youngster of tomorrow will be different from the youngster of today, who's very different from the youngster of yesterday. So, unless we are, uh, are ready with the challenges and have strategies to ensure that people have a great experience, an experience that keeps them in the game, and we have pathways that suit all players. So it's not just about the very best, but 
obviously we need pathways for them, then, you know, we're not prepared. And ultimately, national bodies and the clubs are the custodians of the game and they need to make sure that they look after it. Yeah, and like you say, uh, the, the world is changing and things are changing as well. Um, and even here, um, football is the number one sport in junior, but even Aussie rules and other sports, um, although the population is growing, we are having, we consider the, the, the amount of more people that move to Western Australia, we have the same number. So that's mean we are losing players. Um, and many players don't want to play because they are playing PlayStation for the lockdown, so things like that. And they get used to, to do that. And then the parents don't have, if we want to call it the power to say to the kids, you know, no, go and play, go do a sport. And then by doing different initiatives, we can reconnect with those players. But if we don't do much about it, then or we could say, oh, football is the number one sport. But it's not going to happen in four or five years because once you start losing numbers and then you're looking five years later, then it will take a lot of more work to fix it rather than if you are proactive now. I do wonder about the, the, the retention rate, whether actually the game caters for, for all tastes. So, you know, the, the um, obviously the pressure is, you know, join your academy, you know, become excellent be a pro, all those type of things. Now, there's costs associated with that, which are an, are an inhibitor straight away. But there's also uh, the other end of the spectrum is those who just don't, those who just want to play, they don't want to train. So what, what's on the marketplace for them? Because the standard model is train twice a week, play on Saturday. Mm. Well, what if I don't want to do that? How about three games a week, you know, or two games a week where I just turn up, play, um, and it's casual. It's still valid. And I think we need to, you know, and actually there's a model there that could generate revenue, which would offset the other side of the game. You know, we need to be a bit more inventive, if you like, in terms of catering for the whole spectrum of people who, uh, you know, in the modern society, um, don't want to commit to three days a week for their sport. They're happy just to turn up and play. And, and, and I think this is where we need to, to sort of move our mindset from the traditional affiliated model and find a, a model which the game controls but is less affiliated less rule bound all right Rob, so to be honest i could be talking uh, with you for four days um, but i would like to uh thank you for your time um and sharing your knowledge and experience with with all of us uh, personally um, like myself and many other coaches that will have the privilege to be in, in workshop courses with you, um, A license, B license, um, we learn so much and we, you, in a way, you shape us to try to become better. But also I know you personally, um, especially doing the A license where what 20 days and see you every day. And for me, what amazed me the most was that um, you care so much about the people. Um, um, doing after the course when it was raining or no, and you run outside to get someone an umbrella. Um, and I just saw my face, you know, I was like, wow, these guys are really amazing because um, sometimes people just, oh, yeah, eight to four and they run a course and they finish, but you really um, care about the people and what you do. Um, for me, it was a great example of, you know, um, when you're a coach educator, it's it's not just ticking the boxes or the content, it's about that connection with the people. So um, um, yeah, I would like to acknowledge that. And, and I feel emotional even because I remember that time. Um, but yeah, thank you, Rob. Thanks, Juan. Well, it's a uh, really generous feedback and praise. And really, yeah, very touching to be honest, mate. And the other thing is, I mean, ultimately football, the only asset in football, apart from the ball, is the people. And uh, uh, over the years, I'm not sure we're very good at the people bit. Mm. If I'm candid, you know, and we can be a lot better at the people bit. And so uh, if you don't start that way, you can't expect it back, can you? <laughs> and once we lose uh, the good people, it's, 
it's hard to get them back or you get other people but it's not the same and yeah then you're like mm, that was a really good car yeah. what you like yeah. yeah so anyway thanks i really appreciate that uh, those kind words is generous thank you very much thank you rob thank you again hopefully see you soon again be strong yep. um, keep busy and yeah wish you all the best thank you and you keep at it too Good way. Good luck to you in football West. Good work. Thank you, Rob. Take care. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye bye.